Welcome back. After last week's success on Linear B, we had so many people joining us. The edited video of Professor Godard's talk is now online on our Inscribe website. So big topic today, the invention of writing in China. And this is a gift that keeps on giving. Last year, we had Bill Bowles, who showcased how original that invention was. And then in January, during, uh, during our four-day workshop, Francoise Bottero opened up to the possibility that China may have taken writing from a pre-existing culture with a pre-existing script. And today we really wanted to offer a different view, another view, because we really like to anatomize and break things down. Um, and we want to juggle topics with different ideas. So this is why we invited Professor Paula De Matte, who I need to thank profusely because she attended the workshop very assiduously. She was there every day and asked some pretty tough questions. So we do love that too. And here she is today. Thank you, Paula, so much. Paula De Matte is Professor of Chinese Art and Archaeology at the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence. She holds a degree in Chinese language and literature from the, Uni the University of Venezia, l'Università degli Studi di Venezia in Italy, and a PhD in archaeology from UCLA in the US. She specializes in the Neolithic and Bronze Age archaeology of China and has written on the origins of Chinese writing, early urbanism, archaic jades, and rock art, prehistoric rock art in China. She also has a very keen interest in religion, in Buddhist art, and in the Silk Road, and in Eastern and Western contacts and exchanges. She curated an exhibition at the Getty Center, from which a, a volume co-authored on China's exchange, exchanges with Europe uh, ensued, uh, with a focus from the 16th to the 19th centuries AD. And the book is entitled China on Paper with Getty Press, um, year 2007. Before we begin, let me announce that our next guest, who is going to be Sarah Finlayson from the University of Heidelberg, has a very good title, which is leaning towards cognitive studies, and she will be dealing with the Aegean looking for readers in the Bronze Age Aegean. That is going to be in two weeks time on March 17th. The usual uh, time is 4.30, nothing changes there. See you all then. But now, Paola, over to you with the origins of Chinese writing, an alternative view. Thank, thank you, you, Sylvia, for the uh, warm introduction and thank you for all the participants and thank you Sylvia again for the uh, incredibly in instructive uh, conference you organized <laughs> which I thank learned also me. different thing. I guess I should I, I use this title an alternative viewpoint because my position is slightly different from the one uh, that most people that um, uh, study the origins of Chinese art writing hold and the, the, there are two main points. It, it's nothing earth shattering or, you know, I'm not, it's not a paradigm shift by any stretches of the Im imagination. But uh, what I am interested in is uh, examining the total record of, uh, um, of what we have for the objects of Chinese writing. Since that has been, the topic has been uh, uh, studied at length and it's, it's been a source of some degree of controversy actually to the point that they're being called the Chinese nationalist, uh, which I guess <laughs> since I'm Italian, I'm actually proud of being defined a Chinese nationalist. Um, the uh, second point was that of resetting the definition of writing in the context of Chinese uh, uh, paleography or the origins of Chinese studies. Uh, because generally the, uh, the definition of writing that has been used, and I don't contest that, but it's very linguistic based. And so I am, you know, I've been uh, very keenly following the debate in Near Eastern and Egyptian studies of the origins of writing for, and also of uh, Mesoamerica, um, reading Baines and uh, Houston and uh, 
um, many others, uh, to see how they approach the definition of writing. In particular, I'm interested in proto writing because I want to disclose this from the very beginning. I'm not an expert on oracle bone inscriptions and later inscriptions. I really worked mostly on Neolithic signs and I was interested really in how signs signify. So um, that is the, the point of view of the alternative in the sense that I am, uh, I want to shift away uh, from, uh, um, want to shift away from this emphasis on linguistics and to look more on how signs work. So first of all, the question of uh, uh, the record, the total record. So generally when we open a book about the uh, Chinese writing, we are told uh, that the oldest inscriptions uh, are oracle bone inscriptions. So these are inscriptions obviously on bone and shoulder, cattle shoulder bones or turtle plastrons, uh, which date to about 1250 BCE, uh, the late Shang dynasty or 1300 at the most. Um, they are mostly uh, in discovery in, in the area of Anyang, which is the last capital of the Shang dynasty. So they are also very circumscribed, except a few pieces have been found elsewhere. So, um, so this is, uh, um, you know, I think it's a problem because it kind of gives you the impression that the, uh, you know, the Chinese were just writing on bones. So it, it not only kind of misrepresents the fact that the, they were using a variety of different other materials to write on, but it also kind of uh, gives the impression that, that writing, and as I have read in some articles, it said that, that writing in China was mostly a religious affair, uh, which is, uh, you know, obviously based only on what we, uh, we can find. So I just want to bring to everybody's attention that the, the Oracle Bones uh, inscription were basically the first discovered in the late 19th century, I think it's about 1898 that they were discovered. Whereas the bronze inscription were known since antiquity and studied um, seriously, at least since the 11th, 10th, uh, 11th 12th century and much more seriously than in the last dynasty, 17th and 20th century. And so there are a lot of catalogs and they were studied also before, um, also during the Han Dynasty, they, these bronzes were being discovered. They had inscription. They didn't know how to read that. They started the paleographic studies really started already in uh, the first to second century um, BC. So, um, and AD, so during the Han Dynasty. So I just wanted to point it out, point out the bronze inscriptions are very important, not only because they have been studied extensively, but also because unlike uh, oracle bone inscriptions, uh, which seem to be mostly an Anyang royal affair, they are actually much more distributed uh, throughout the territory. And also uh, they are, according to some, actually earlier than the bronze, the oracle bone inscriptions. So, and now that is, you know, there's been a big debate because of what kind of inscriptions are we talking about? Some of them are the so-called clan names, so clan inscriptions. And therefore by some, they're not considered real um, writing. Um, that's an all other kind of issue. But um, the, um, the fact of the matter is that uh, these signs appear on bronze uh, vessels like later inscriptions, uh, and they hold the same, many of the same elements uh, that the later uh, writing has. So it's the same component. However, they are arranged in ways that don't allow us to understand what they mean. But one of the reasons is that many of them are probably names, and these names are no longer in existence. So, this is the importance, obviously, of bronze description. Some of them are very short in their names. Some, in particularly in the later part of the dynasty, are actually quite long and you know fairly complex. I mean, comparable also to um, to the oracle bone inscription. And essentially, um, they overlap on some things, but the, each has its own uh, kind of a scope. And then the other thing is that from the point of view of calligraphy, they 
they differ, and a scholar from the National Palace Museum in Taipei has argued, uh, others as well, that actually the standard script was the bronze script and that Oracle bone script was actually an abbreviated form. And you can see why, because obviously to write on bone with a knife is particularly difficult. I actually, you know, teaching in an art school, I had students that actually went to the butcher, they got shoulder bones to try to inscribe them and had incredibly hard time. So I can assure that. And also my advisor, Professor Zhou Hongxiang, um, did various studies and he said they had to be soaked and they had to be, so it, it was a very difficult operation to write on bone, but to write on bronze, they didn't write on bronze, they wrote on soft clay and then, um, or with the soft clay, that's another story. So that, uh, according to this professor, um, uh, this scholar, Zhang Kuan Yuan uh, from Taipei, um, what it was done, it was that it was written and then uh, traced, uh, written with the brush, brush and then traced. So that is another thing that can be discussed and so on. Um, but in addition to bronze inscriptions and bone inscriptions, there are actually a bunch of other inscriptions. So there are inscriptions on jade and stone. Some of them are incised um, and some of them are painted, uh, written by brush, such as this one, for instance. Um, and so you see that uh, uh, what, you know, this idea that, you know, the Chinese were all like intent with their bones uh, cutting and, you know, doing divination and that's the only thing they cared has more, much more to do with uh, the um, survival of, you know, of particular materials. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the uh, pre-oracle um, pre bone inscription that comes from, uh, the area of what was probably a pre-Anyang capital in the vicinity of Zhengzhou, uh, which was also probably a capital, at the uh, Xiaoshuanqiao, um, has an inscription painted, um, and this is no doubt uh, um, a Chinese character. It was painted on a jar or a vat that was probably used to ferment a wine or something like that. And it was painted with a brush and uh, with cinnabar. And uh, that's also the case of the inscription painted on jade. They were painted with the cinnabar and sometimes on bone as well with cinnabar or with black ink as well. So in any case, the tradition of writing with by brush was well in, its, in existence. So it really, if you think about what we have is bones, stone, uh, bronze, uh, jade and ceramic. These are all materials that obviously survive pretty well in uh, um, the archaeological record. And also you, we have to consider the fact that China has a particular climate. So if, for instance, in Egypt, uh, you're much more likely to find uh, papyrus. Uh, in China, you probably don't find it, but we'll come to discuss that as well. You know, any kind of uh, uh, organic material. So, um, the other point that I made is what is writing? Um, so the, 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 one of the, the things that I always found rather unnerving in relation to the origins of Chinese writing is that uh, the assumption seems to be uh, no matter uh, if the idea is that there is sudden invention or like evolution from the Neolithic is that uh, it has to do with language. So that it really comes into being to record language. Now, I don't dispute that the definition of writing um, is that it does record language. What I dispute is that it does come into being to record language. So that the, if it doesn't record language, then it's not, it has nothing to do with writing. So I, you know, I think that there are at least three components uh, in the context of writing. So it's obviously pictures, symbols, numbers and quantities, and then eventually, <clears throat> the language literally gets into the picture. But that happens uh, as our colleagues in Mesopotamia studying the record uh, in Mesopotamia and Egypt and in, um, in Mesoamerica know full well, that happens uh, at a later stage. Now this stage is not documented, this progression is not well documented in China. But it is actually, uh, there, there is uh, uh, evidence. So 
I just uh, uh, want to point out, uh, and I apologize for like maybe not using appropriate thing, but uh, for instance, if we look at these uh, tablets uh, uh, from Egypt, uh, we see that uh, most likely these uh, are not, uh, don't have a phonetic component. I stand to be corrected by anybody that knows better than me. Uh, same thing for the earliest tablets. Uh, um, they seem to be numeric, have numbers and to have uh, names, but they, and it's, again, I stand to be corrected, they don't seem to have uh, phonetization or uh, verbs. Now, it took a considerable amount of time in uh, um, the context of uh, cuneiform to come to that. And uh, um, I think, mm, you know, I, I, at least 600 years for a, a complete uh, phonetization. So the question is, uh, um, why is it that the script uh, like, uh, uh, oracle bone or even bronze inscription, but the oracle bone has been front and center, has been really um, said to be the beginning of Chinese writing and uh, to have emerged suddenly. Because the oracle bone inscription are actually quite complex. I mean, some of them are simple, like this one you see here is not particularly complex. Um, you know, it has a, a positive and a negative um, and has various numbers here that, that indicate the various divination points. So these are very simple, but if you actually um, uh, look at some other one, they are fairly complex. So, so one of them very well known is the divination that has to do with the queen uh, Fu Hao, Lady Hao, the wife uh, of King Wu Ding, who was really one of the uh, kings that promoted the oracle bone inscription. And this one is very long and complex. Uh, um, and according to some may have been, um, uh, you know, it basically documents a series of events that took place uh, over um, multiple days. So there's first the, the the preface, the divination on which day, and uh, the question, will Huaha delivery be auspicious? And then, uh, you know, the, the, the prognostication that basically says on which day, uh, if it is on that day, it will be auspicious, not auspicious. And there's also verification. And here we find out that after 31 days, the delivery was on the wrong day, and therefore it was not auspicious, and it was a girl. I don't know if he was not auspicious because it was a girl. That's what somebody has argued, or if he was not auspicious because uh, the girl just didn't look right. Um, but in any case, uh, this uh, inscription, um, it's fair, it begins over here, and it's fairly in, in complex, uh, and it contains uh, various parts of speech that are either loan words, uh, but certainly they. Um, they uh, follow the linguistic structure of the time. Now, it is interesting because if we look at these inscriptions uh, and we uh, kind of study the grammar, any like uh, it's not super complex, but it's very similar to classical Chinese in many aspects, the construction and also the use of particles. Um, and they are parts of speech such as this uh, uh, part here, which are kind of, uh, uh, phonetic loans that are used to indicate uh, adverbs and particles, et cetera. So these are really, um, you know, getting into the key of the, um, the, say, grammatical structure of the language. And so it, this is kind of unlikely that some, it, this level of complexity um, would um, happen just uh, overnight that you know all of a sudden somebody invents this script creates all these words there are about the 4000 uh, characters in oracle bone inscription just uh, keep in mind that in current use uh, in modern chinese there are probably um well i mean the total number of chinese characters about 60000 or more but you know, a literate person knows about 5,000. So, I mean, we are not, and, and obviously there are all these various ways to look at it. Are they compound words? Are they, you know, whatever. I mean, so there is a fair, fairly high number of characters. 
many of them are not completely understood. So there are about a thousand that are fully understood. Many others are not understood because they are probably in names of clans, people, uh, or uh, names of things that we don't use anymore. We don't know what they are, um, and therefore they are not uh, um, reported. So this is another uh, fairly complex expression, etc. So same thing with the, this inscription that I um, showed you um, before. Um, this is it's in bronze and it is a rubbing of the bronze inscription. And it's interesting to see that the inscription is also paired with the clan name. Now, generally in the early inscription, you only have this, uh, this clan names. Um, this indicates Fu, um, Fu Ding, this is very little to see. So this is considered standard script, but this part over here, it's not. Uh, it's kind of a cartouche that probably includes the clan name. So some, some scholars have, argue that that's not writing. So when you find it in the earliest inscription, you only find the cartouche, that is deemed not to be writing, but it does appear alongside writing and it does have elements inside the cartouche that are the same as the inscriptions. So this inscription here is fairly long and uh, you know it, it, it tells a story that also is something to be keep, kept in mind that oracle body inscription really ask questions about divination that are very specific. Whereas bronze inscription is a different kind of record. It's much more historical narrative. Um, and even, yeah, I would say narrative is really the beginning of an, an historical narrative. So for instance, this one, it says that on such and such a day, the king said that we honor our eminent ancestor with a ceremony. Uh, the ceremony was accomplished. Uh, the offerings were brought in, presented and so on. And then um, in occasion of this thing, the, uh, the bronze vessel was, um, was uh, made. So we already have an idea that there is something behind all these inscriptions that you know, they have to be inscribed on these bronzes also. So there, there is only a, a, you know, you just don't go and write on, on a bronze vessel, even if you write it in clay on the clay mold, but there has to be an apparatus that, and all this suggests uh, that writing is very widespread. The other thing to keep in mind is the type of characters that uh, basically uh, build up, uh, uh, that constitute um, Chinese, uh, the, the oracle bone and the bronze inscriptions. So uh, don't wanna incur in the wrath of modernists, but I, I rely a lot on uh, Chinese scholarship and traditional Chinese scholarship starting from the first to second century AD kind of investigated the structure of characters. So, so this scholar Xu Sheng wrote this piece dictionary, the Zhuo Wenjie Zi, in which he uh, started to make distinction between characters. And apparently the Wen are simple characters, probably pictographs, and the Zi are compound characters. So, so this is already kind of an interesting analysis. Um, he also identified six, six different types of uh, characters. So when we look at the character, uh, Chinese characters, whether we know Chinese or we don't know Chinese, oftentimes we tend to see the square with a lot of strokes and we recognize it because we, or we don't recognize it if we don't know Chinese, but they all kind of look, you know, similar in the sense that they all fit into the square. But in fact, they differ. Um, and uh, even though this is not particularly clear now, it was very clear in antiquity the, that the characters were um, different. So um, what the uh, Xu Sheng um, kind of uh, identified were uh, six different types. And the pictographs, the indicative symbols, pictophonetic compounds, the logical compounds, phonetic borrowings. And then one form of this is extension of meaning that the, um, we don't know what it means and I'm gonna leave that out. But um, I just want to point out that this is the way even the modern script, if we want it, could be analyzed with. But uh, this traditional way to look at the script, at the type of characters 
does apply also to Oracle Bone. So, so there is no substantial difference between the script of the Oracle Bone inscription or the bronze inscription, the script of the Bronze Age and the modern script. I mean, this is something that has to be kept in mind. I mean, nobody uses the same script. Only the Chinese use the same script that they invented from, from day one, because obviously in, in Egypt, they don't use this, the original script and neither do they in Mesopotamia. The only one are the Greeks, but the Greeks don't have a primary writing system. They have an alphabetic writing system. So it's important to see this connection because this complexity that appears already in Oracle Bones, also the complexity of the types of signs. Um, so it's not only the grammatical structure, but it's also the types of sign cannot have happened overnight. You can't have these differences of uh, constructions of signs, right? So Chinese signs are, you know, self-contained units of sound and meaning. So they are morphemic signs. And in fact, some, some people would say that the Chinese writing system is more for um, morphemic. Right. So they are um, those uh, signs that are considered pictographs or um, so there are things like representation of things like you know, child, woman, um, this is the oracle bone forms, and then this is all the evolution to the modern. So pretty well documented. So this is straightforward pictograph. They were pictographs. They are not obviously pictographs today. They are, today they are symbols. They're very abstract. Uh, if you're not told what they are, you wouldn't recognize it. But in antiquity, they were. So that's the one type of sign is the pictograph. And there are a variety of them, and they use different techniques to represent the thing, either uh, you know side view, frontal view, um, uh, top view, etc., depending on the shape of uh, the thing represented. And that um, it's interesting also the comparison that we can make with rock art, which is another of my fields of study. There are also these so-called uh, indicative symbols, which some in, in modern Mm, studies, they could also be considered to be a form of pictograph. Um, so they just indicate concepts uh, visually. Um, and uh, I guess it could be considered from the Pearson semiotic point of view, it could be considered an indexical sign. Um, interesting is this comparison between the pictograph for, for knife and the uh, indicative symbol ran for edge blade where Basically, there's a little sign here that points to blade, and that this still exists in, in today's script, right? So not only do we have pictographs, so we have signs that are a different version of a pictograph. There are also the logical compounds, and this has been a source of big you know, controversy because of the issue of the, the use of the term ideograph by some scholars. We have actually heard at the, the conference, there was a big debate whether ideographs exist or don't exist. I don't wanna enter into the controversy and I don't, uh, I don't, that is some debate that we can have. But in any case, according to traditional paleography, there are compounds that are only semantic. So they're made up of two semantic parts with no phonetic. Now, there are people that have uh, argued that that is a fallacy, that in fact, uh, they are cryptophonetic components. So that they are components that look semantic, but in fact, lo and behold, they're phonetic. But these are, I think, acrobatics. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, I have looked at several proposals from that point of view. And uh, I found uh, that I find it unconvincing. So uh, logical compounds. So two people in front of a, uh, of a vessel with some food uh, face in the vessel, um, and it's a Xiang uh, banquet. And now in later time, they add also qualification with the food section down below. Other uh, logical compound could be this one in which this component, basic components that we have like mother and child get uh, kind of reorganized and they create different meanings. So, so I don't know, do we want to call them ideographs, but they are certainly 
uh, logical compounds. That's the way it's usually translated, uh, whereby you really represent uh, the act. And now the, I don't want to simplify because the, the types of characters are uh, with the slight variations uh, are immense. So I'm just giving you a little of uh, um, kind of a view into it. But the representation of uh, um, an event is also there, right? So it's a form of uh, pictography. Um, so in fact, in recent studies, they just have uh, three characters, three types of characters. They, you know, one is fundamentally pictographic that includes pictographs, uh, uh, you know, indicative symbols, as well as logical compounds. They are considered all pictographs. There are then the phonetic parts. There are pictophonetic compounds, so, so such as the one that have on one side, they're generally on the right side, but not always. It can be also on top. A semantic part that identifies what is uh, the general category of the thing indicated. And then on the left, generally on the left, but not always, uh, there is a component that is phonetic that gives a vague idea of how to pronounce the thing. Now, the problem is that obviously the language has changed. So for instance, the character Jiang for river um, in Southern China uh, has a phonetic that today is read gong. Um, and yet the, in Mandarin Chinese, that character is read Jiang. However, in Cantonese and uh, um, in other languages in Southern China is still pronounced gong. And therefore we do know that there is this connection. Now he, Northern China with the phonetic k, he, k. The fact is that in general, the phonetic in the, it, the Chinese characters are composed in a very flexible way. So they have, uh, phonetics that give kind of an idea of what the pronunciation might be, but also they don't have a very specific place. They can be moving around, right? So they never really it came to a point that they decided, okay, these signs indicate this sound, and therefore only this sign is going to be in, used to indicate that sound. Now, there are multiple sound, uh, signs that could indicate the same sign sound, and uh, they could be positioned in different ways and organized in different ways. So it was uh, um, very flexible and at the same time um, uh, somewhat confusing. Um, so that also that is another thing that can be discussed. Why is that? And now some people have argued that because China is such a large country and even in antiquity, there were so many different languages spoken, a flexible, um, phonetic uh, indication gives uh, just the general idea of how to pronounce it and you get that this idea and that it is an idea that applies to a wide variety of spoken languages whereas if you are very strict then you would have more difficulty um, kind of a, um, relating to that but there's also the question of the language spoken in ancient China um, what it, it's not the, it's different from the one I spoken today, obviously, but it's different in the sense that the modern Chinese is tonal and it started to be tonal from the post Han period. But during the previous period, it was not tonal and had much more complexity of initials and, uh, um, uh, and uh, a variety of other things. So, so how does that script really represent that um, language, um, could it be that there are different components that, uh, you know, kind of represents these different initials? So that's uh, something that the experts in, in phonetic probably uh, may be able to explain. And uh, I think Baxter and Sagart have done uh, great advances in that field and very interesting work. There are then a lot of phonetic borrowings. That's another category that you find in oracle borrowing inscription. For instance, one is lie, uh, lie um, originally indicating drain, but then used to indicate the verb to come. And, uh, uh, or the, um, the adverb, the um, E also, which originally indicated the armpits. But it's interesting to notice that 
in um, oracle bone inscription E and many other particles are never used for the original mean. So it's never used to indicate armpits. I guess in oracle bone inscription, they're probably not talking about armpits. But the, 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 the good question is, if there is a phonetic borrowing, then it's borrowed from a character that was in use for something else. And at a certain point, it becomes a loan word, right? And a new character gets developed for armpit. Same thing for grain. So the, the thing is, that, you know, there are characters in Oracle Bones that are loan words, they're identical, used as loan words and also as um, for the original meaning. But there are some that are not used for the original meaning at all. So the question is, oh, well, if, if the Oracle Bones inscriptions is the earliest you can possibly have, um, so why would you not have a, you know, the, this use of the, you know, why would they even come up with the script with the, with a sign like that, that, uh, you know, is immediately used as a loan word. Uh, that was the thing. So finally, another thing to consider is the, the fact that the, the inscription really record um, grammar pretty well. And um, the construction is, as I said before, very close to classical Chinese. So that you know, essentially, if you are literate in classical Chinese, uh, which most people that are educated are, you can read the oracle bone inscription, provided that you know what the graphs look like and um, in how to translate the graphs. So the construction is mostly, mostly uh, subject, verb, object, but there are also construction that are subject, verb, indirect object, direct object, or subject object verb. And this one is interesting because uh, the, the, when the indirect object is transposed before, it really follows the grammatical structure of the spoken language. The other thing to keep in mind is the kind of word classes there are in oracle bone and in bronze inscriptions with, for which we have most of the thing. Now, according to Chinese traditional uh, grammatology, um, there are content words and empty words. Now, content words are name, collective names, et cetera, et cetera. Empty words are the conjunction, preposition, and modal particles. So all these word classes are represented in this Shang, in Shang writing. And it's interesting, there are a lot of words, but there are also things like collective name and classifiers that are a typical and particular thing that is typical of Chinese. So in Chinese, for instance, when you say a table, uh, you do not just say one table, but you say yi zhang zhuo zi, which basically is uh, one flat type of thing, table, okay? So uh, it is like a pair of gloves or you know, a dozen eggs. So these are the classifiers. So you start to have classifiers already in in this inscription and they continue down to the present, right? They are still not completely developed. There are a variety of different uh, numerals, the standard numerals with uh, numbers that go up to 10,000. Uh, there are also other numerical systems. There are verbs that have auxiliaries, transitive and intransitive, some are bisyllabic, adjectives with color, space and time, Adverbs pronounced, which are personal, demonstrative, singular, and plural. And then there are all the empty words. Now, empty words by definition, because they are conjunction, preposition, and model particles, they can't really be pictographic. They're mostly loan words. So the question is, how did this complexity really begin? Right. So the one of these uh, things like, well, you know, they just invented it. Some invention, they just sat down at the table and they invented the script. You know, they just said that we need this, we need that, and that. A uh, couple of hundred years and, uh, you know, everything was ironed out. Well, I just don't believe it. Uh, you know, everybody obviously is entitled to their opinion. I just don't believe this story. Another option is the stimulus diffusion from the West. Now, the different versions of stimulus diffusion. Uh, Gelb had said, you know, writing was invented once and spread everywhere. And so writing came to China um, from Mesopotamia, from, um, in any case, from the West. 
um, they are different versions also of, of the idea of diffusion. Some people say it's just the idea of writing the cane. The question is, um, how did this idea really come since the, the Chinese writing system is really designed for Chinese, for the Chinese language. So it's not like, uh, you know, once you uh, basically adopt a writing system, an idea of a writing system coming from another language, you always had to make this uh, um, very, uh, you know, ad these adaptations. So I am not convinced of the idea of stimulus diffusion. Um, some people have argued that, that, that there was all a complex of things that came into the Bronze Age. I mean, the big question uh, has always been, well, you know, writing begins in China at the 12, uh, 1300 BCE. And at the same time, there is this, all this growth of, of bronze making, um, metallic activities, the, uh, the chariot is introduced, uh, there are a lot of contacts with the Central Asia that my friend Li Min has uh, suggested. And also there is an introduction of cowrie shell, which apparently came from India. So the, this complex basically was introduced wholesale alongside the writing. But there is no evidence that such a thing happened. That that's, uh, you know, it's true, cowrie shells probably came from India. So the, so the bronze uh, probably was introduced uh, um, from uh, the nomads uh, the route north south and uh, so did the chariot and the horse but uh, i just don't see any evidence that nomads of eurasia at that time had a writing system that they could introduce to the chinese and there is nothing in the archaeological record that suggests so there are obviously places in central asia and marjana um, that have some uh, kind of scripts, but I don't think that that really can connect with the Chinese script. So I toss out the, um, the idea of a diffusion from the West. The other thing is the slow evolution from late Neolithic science system. That's my position. Now, this uh, position has been taken by some to just, uh, um, you know, kind of indicate that any sign from the Neolithic um, has to do with Chinese writing. And one of the, the problems is, has been that uh, particularly in China, they have found this science and in an effort to connect them to writing, they have insisted that they can be pronounced, that they have a phonetic value. I don't believe that you need that. And uh, I also don't believe that writing started at 8,000 BC or 5,000 BC. Uh, I think the, I, I believe that as the connection is really with the late Neolithic. So um, for instance, uh, you know, there are these signs that come from Jiahu, uh, 5,000 BC on a bone, this shard, the 2,500 BC. I'm very skeptical of these objects. Uh, um, particularly the Jiahu, uh, maybe it, perhaps it's a Shang intrusion, or I don't know, or maybe who knows. But I am I'm not very convinced that these objects date to 5000 BC. At least the objects may date to 5000 BC, but the inscription may not. Um, so I don't I don't know. There's also the particularly on the bone the shape of the signs are very strange because there's a combination of signs. Some signs look like uh, oracle bone signs and some look like modern characters. So, so it just uh, doesn't add up. I have seen this bone and uh, I looked at the grooves and uh, the grooves just seem just not right. Um, this thing gong shard, uh, took a lot of attention, uh, grabbed a lot of attention because it's late Neolithic. This one, however, is also kind of strange in the sense that these characters, these signs um, don't have any connection to Chinese writing. So it has been suggested that it's like Eastern E barbarian writing, where well, we don't have any evidence of Eastern E barbarian writing. So I, I don't know. The other problem with this shirt is that it was found at washing time 
and uh, um, so it's uh, it's also unclear, um, you know, its uh, exact uh, um, discovery. It was engraved after it was broken as a shard, which is kind of unusual in China. They generally are inscriptions on the pots, but this one was written as an ostracon, so um, um, it's kind of strange. Um, so there are, however, there are other things that are authentic, but also don't necessarily have any connection with writing because they're probably too early, but they do signify um, kind of a, what would I say, a certain use of symbols and signs that we, is pretty pervasive in the Neolithic. Um, and uh, very interesting is also the stuff about uh, maybe 4,000 this piece from uh, the Yangshao culture in Northwest China that has this kind of pictograph like uh, representation and it has also more pop marks like but also this one, I don't know. I don't know how to connect to writing directly. Um, the only thing I can think of is the fact that these symbols remain in the collective uh, consciousness, and they continue to circulate, right? Uh, but it's uh, but they are still somewhat too early to connect directly. So I'm more interested in what happens in the late Neolithic with a variety of cultures, uh, particularly here in Eastern China, and then in the Yellow River Valley further to the West, but also down here in the South and the Yangtze River Delta area and the middle Yangtze River Valley. Um, that there are this culture that in the late Neolithic start to interact very closely. Uh, and uh, we see it from the archaeological record. And so starting from about 3000 to 2000 BC, you start to have a variety of incised graphs that have a um, much more logical connection to what um, we see in the Bronze Age. So we have the Dawanko in the Eastern coast. This is uh, uh, Shu in uh, middle Yangtze River Valley. Um, the Yangshao in the Northwest, the Longshan, uh, most of the Yellow, Yellow River Valley, Taosu in the Western part of the Yellow River Valley and Lianzhu um, in the Yangtze Delta area. They have signs uh, that are fairly interesting. And for me, the most in interesting are the one from Tao and Ko because they can be compared with later signs of the um, um, of the Bronze Age, particularly with the clan names. Now, this uh, this has uh, been front and center of, of the discussion, and uh, I think a lot of people have recognized their potential connection with Chinese writing. But the debate has always been, well, they don't have a sound, therefore they're not writing, and uh, or yes, they do have a sign uh, sound, but you can read it like this modern character. And I and uh, so my my question is, I don't care about that. Um, you know, I'm only interested in the sign as a sign, not in whether or not it has a phonetic value, because we cannot establish if it does. Um, first of all, and uh, it's um, it's just also irrelevant to the main question. So, for instance. Uh, um, this character, this sign here, this graph here, um, from the Taoan Ko culture in Shandong province, uh, has this thing here as being interpreted as uh, Shan, this is a Kuo fire, and this is mountain. So then this uh, have been all placed together, and the characters being read as something or other, but not very clear. Uh, this other one is being interpreted as axe. So the fact, the interesting stuff is that there are very similar to the pictographs for these things in later time. So that's what should not be discounted. But they cannot, like we, you know, you can't read this thing. Um, it doesn't mean anything. But there are many of them and they appear on these vats that are used for the making of, um, of wine probably for the, um, fermentation or wine, which is very central to the um, ritual activities, uh, particularly in association with ancestor worship. 
And so you find them buried in burials, in tombs, uh, generally one or two per burial, um, and the Taiwan gold, Taiwan gold context. And there's something also slightly different like that one. These are very large bats. And uh, see here, there's one here on the elite burials. And I think another one is here. Um, so they're generally elite burials that have a lot of the uh, late Dawanko culture. And um, they generally appear in tombs that, that have a lot of accoutrements that have to do with, you know, kind of upper class individuals, but particularly sets of vessels, so like wine vessels probably, um, used for these rituals. So there is a connection between uh, ritual and uh, the science and wine. And so that's uh, something to be done. Now in the same context, we find also other signs which have been kind of difficult to interpret. I mean, they, they look very similar to the trigrams. Um, and trigrams have been considered also a form of writing in ancient China. So that there is a presence of that uh, and use of uh, turtles for divinations as well. So there is a particular tradition that really connects this Neolithic stuff with the Bronze Age. Now, if we go even a little bit further away from the core Taiwan Co, we find actually the same signs are slightly different also at which is in Anhui province. And uh, in, uh, um, however, in a, a more domestic uh, rather than burial context and with similar signs. But there is a certain difference. They're slightly different. And at the same time, it seems like Ichisa is kind of a, an area where the Davanko people expanded farther west from their homeland. Then you go to the South Central, the Yangtze River Valley, and you find bats that are very similar with the somewhat similar signs. So the bats are the same, right? Or similar at least. Um, but they are used differently. Instead of being in burials uh, individually, they are buried in long lines, stacked one inside the others in ritual context. And they all have the signs. And it's interesting. So this signs that you see here, some of them are, uh, these are fragmented, but some of them are similar to the one from Dawan Ko. So the uh, impression is, that there is an expansion of this Dawan Ko culture and it's kind of signing uh, and ritual activities that then slowly takes over. There is in the south uh, of the, um, the Delta area, there are some jades that probably come from that area, but they have not been found archeological. They carry this kind of uh, icons and uh, with a bird. Now, some of them have a part that is very similar to the Dawan Ko thing. Now, these are a little bit uh, difficult to classify because all these jades, for the most part, have not been excavated archaeologically, but they have been in uh, uh, imperial collections for the most part. And uh, they are in the National Palace Museum, the Freer Gallery in Washington, and uh, in, um, in other collections uh, in Beijing. And the impression is that they probably all came from the same area, maybe a set of objects that was inscribed. Uh, others do not seem to be inscribed, but they seem to have a connection with the Taiwan Go, particularly with this uh, icon here, which is called the sun fire icon, because it's fine that. And then also the presence of these signs inside. And there is also a typical object uh, from this uh, culture, a uh, jade object that has the same sign. So there seems to be also an expansion south of the Dawan Ko culture with its symbols that comes uh, to impact this other culture that eventually is wiped out. So I think there's a pattern of expansion from the Eastern coast. And uh, we also see this connection um, in, in other aspects. This is from Dawan Ko and this is from uh, Yanju, so this is from eastern north the Shandong coast, and this is from the Delta area. So we see kind of a, a, a pattern of connection. 
Now, um, we also have a slightly different thing. Um, this big jar was actually a funerary urn. And it has a, uh, from this late, late Yang Shaomiao to go about 3000 BC. E from Henan, so an area further inland, but very close to, um, I mean, kind of closer to the heart of the later Xiangshan um, uh, Bronze Age domains. So this was an adult burial, uh, urn burial. And it has a little, very interesting combination of an ax and then this thing that suggests that this may be a name. Um, they are, uh, connection, these are uh, bronze inscriptions over here that have this kind of combinations. So we see this some kind of connections between these Neolithic signs and some clan names from the, um, from the Bronze Age. So circumstantial evidence, uh, yes. Then we enter into uh, the final phase of the late Neolithic at uh, the Longshan, particularly Chen Ziyai. Now there are a lot of pop marks and they are generally being dismissed as, well, these are just pop marks. However, some, um, so some they may be just numbers that are engraved on things, but others are more complex. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, Li Ji is still early on in the 1930s, uh, identify well some of the numbers, uh, but some other things uh, like this one, um, this Chen Ziyai, late Neolithic, late final Neolithic, uh, Shandong, for dog, Chuan, is very similar to Oracle Bone and Bronze inscriptions. Um, and then there is this graph uh, which indicates uh, this character that is used in this alphanumerical. Um, kind of a system and other things. So obviously, um, you know, we don't really have a huge amount of stuff, but I mean, I'm just showing a few things that you're not gonna show everything. Probably the most important is uh, um, of the late Neolithic are this, this inscription, the painted inscription on a jar from the Taoist culture, which is the late Yongshan as well in the Shanxi province, so in the western part of China, which is a very large city with even apparently with uh, a astronomical observatory and so on. And in the same area, they found also these basins with this pictorial representation of the dragon, which is also connected to this form of jade dragon was found in another Neolithic culture and connects uh, with the dragon pictograph that is found in Oracle Bone inscription. But the most important is uh, this graph, uh, which has actually been interpreted as the character when and uh, um, some name, and there's been some kind of debate exactly what it means. And that was uh, painted uh, with cinnabar. So that's another, yet another connection. So then we come to the, uh, so I think mean, I arrived to the late Neolithic, we have to connect on to the, um, to the Bronze Age. So there's been um, this site, the particular site of early To, which is, by, according to some, is the site of uh, the last capital of the first dynasty of China, Xia, which is by some considered a real entity and by others uh, considered a mythical, mythological kind of a, a creation. In any case, the site of early To, um, about maybe a little bit later, 1900 to 1600 BC, has various of these pot marks, which, uh, um, you know, some of them are very simple, like the one from Chen Ziyai, but some are more complex uh, and, ha and have in fact been interpreted. But more interesting than anything is this bone with this fish pictograph, which is very similar to the one from the Bronze Age. And it's interesting, it's on a, on a bone. Now, uh, it's not much, There's, there are some other, a few, some other things. Then as we progress into the, the second dynasty, the Shang dynasty, so the time of the Oracle Bones, so we find more um, uh, graphs, uh, particularly from Southern China, the site of Wuchang in, uh, in um, 
and GNC province, uh, we have sequences of things, even though it's not very clear what they mean. And also this area is a little bit beyond the domain of the Shang, and it's not completely clear that they use the same writing system, but they may actually have adopted some signs. Then at the, uh, at the area of Zhengzhou, which is properly Shang, there is a vast number of these kind of uh, um, pop marks, uh, very simple, some of them. But then at the site of Xiaoshunqiao, as I mentioned before, there are these uh, characters uh, painted in cinnabar on jars. So what do we make of all this? Um, and here there are, uh, this, there are several characters are found. These are the ones that are clearly interpreted um, that you see here on the top, the Xiaoshan Chuao, and then um, the um, bronze inscription version and the modern transcription. So what do we make of all that? How do we come to the, you know, how do we come to the bronze, to the, the oracle bones? The oracle bones are obviously um, much more complex, right? And uh, um, particularly also the bronze inscription, the clan names and so on. So circumstantial evidence and materiality, I would say, is the um, thing. So first of all is the similarity of some of Neolithic graphs. Uh, I'm much more a supporter of uh, the Tao and Co signs, uh, Tao and Co and Tao Su as well. So the similarity of some signs uh, suggests the connection, but obviously there's a lot of stuff that is also missing. Another thing is the material connection between forms and writing that comes, uh, you know, though you have it, uh, well, this is a Fourier urn, so it's maybe somewhat different, but these are all jars that come down to, um, um, you know, the Bronze Age, from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age, that essentially carry this kind of science. Uh, whether they are the same thing, there seems to be a connection between ritual and particularly wine-based ritual and uh, writing. Um, we have, I have noticed uh, studying some stuff about pot marks in on uh, Greek amphora, but there's been studies also about pot marks in uh, Chinese um, um, vats. They they seem to basically indicate uh, uh, the quantity of or type of content. So some of these uh, pot marks that we see are not directly relevant to writing, but some um, more pictographic ones, maybe. So the, the question is, why do we have, you know, so little evidence to kind of connect the down and go more pictographic signs um, onto, um, uh, onto the writing? that we know existed in the Bronze Age during the Shang Dynasty. Well, most likely because the writing was, you know, performed on, on different surfaces. So um, most likely was done by brush rather than on the surfaces that have survived. There is in fact a, um, a graph in our Bon inscription that seemed to represent uh, the character for brush or brush writing or writing or painting. Now, this character uh, is present in Oracle Bond inscription and also this one, but um, it does not indicate to write in that context. It indicates um, an individual name. But in later time, I mean, this form, this hand and this sticks really comes down to be interpreted um, to be this character brush, which has the addition of the bamboo on top. So maybe, maybe not that they were writing with the brush, but that they were writing with a the brush, there is plenty of evidence because um, there is that Tao Se painted jar, there's stuff from Anyang painted in black. Um, there is the vat from Xiaoshan Shao. There are, there's jade writing painted in cinnabar, uh, and there are also oracle bones that are actually write, written with the brush. So it seems to be that the standard writing of the time was actually brush writing. 
some of the documents however were recorded by incision on bone and some on stone but we have to keep in mind that most likely we have lost that principal uh, source now cinnabar it's another thing that you know it's not only that they wrote with cinnabar cinnabar was a very important ritual material so actually even in the Tao and Go Neolithic signs, these are smeared with cinnabar, this particular one, not all of them, but the most important one tend to be smeared. So it's interesting to look at some oracle bones are also smeared with red uh, to make them either more visible or to um, make them more relevant. Now, some inscription is smeared with black also. So there, there's a kind of a, different use of colors to identify, to highlight things. But uh, this, um, this connection of uh, the use of cinnabar and writing and the brush, um, it's another thing to keep in mind. Then finally, there's the question of what did they write on? So it has been assumed that most of the documents were written on bamboo strips. And in fact, in um, Oracle bone inscription and in bronze inscription, we have this character, which is the book is still in use. Uh, and it shows these strips and this, that are tied up in different forms, etc. There's another version, it's classic, which basically shows the same thing. And now it has been said that this character does not, uh, um, so it basically represents this, uh, kind of object. Now these objects were found archeologically, uh, but in much later times. They are found uh, starting from the late Zhou Dynasty about uh, you know, 500, 600 BCE, in particular context uh, where the, uh, they're either waterlogged or they're very dry. So from the, for instance, from the Northwest in, um, in the desert. So they have been preserved there, but anything earlier than that has never been found. Now it has to be kept in mind that the, the one they're found, they're found in Southern China in these waterlogged conditions in, in tombs that were sealed very well and that, that had no oxygen entry. Now the situation at Anyang near the Yellow River is completely different. So organic material probably doesn't survive as well. Um, and uh, the other thing is that the area has been the subject of intense floods from the Yellow River. So a lot of stuff may well have been lost. And maybe with better excavation techniques, eventually we'll be able to find these things. Who knows? But um, it cannot be dismissed also because historical records do talk about documents, bundles of these documents dating to the Xia Dynasty and the Shang Dynasty, that's what uh, um, the historical records say. Uh, the other thing that is interesting is that at some point actually, um, some bone inscriptions are written in this kind of strip-like organization, thus suggesting that writing was also kind of uh, uh, normatively done on the strips. And uh, it's also interesting to see that characters uh, kind of fit more neatly into these vertical lines uh, that they fit into horizontal lines, meaning that they have a certain width that they fall into, but they, they vary a lot in uh, height and they can vary in height because within a vertical strip, you can vary in height, but you can't vary in width because the strip limits you in that. Um, the other thing is that uh, it has been said that, uh, you know, Paula, what are you saying? You know, you crazy one. Um, you don't, you know, that uh, it's never used to indicate books in Oracle Bone Inscription. Well, uh, that's not true. I have here a page from the Jiago and Sujian, and the, the character Z has five meanings. And uh, meaning number one says uh, bamboo strip document. Here's the inscription in Oracle Bone inscription. Here's the translation. And it basically says uh, to offer 
a, um, kind of a offer the documents, but offer the document to said, oh, well, it's a ritual. Yeah, well, it's a ritual that involves the offering of the documents. So there is also a name of a sacrifice that uh, involves uh, offering the documents, but the documents are there. Uh, it's the name also of uh, a neighboring state. Well, that could be a loan word, or it could also be that these people actually supply the bamboo strips. Um, so um, there is then a loan for a different meaning. Uh, so it's used to cut and eliminate. Um, and then uh, interesting, the last one is basically somebody that makes the strip. So that's the content. So uh, to say that so it's never been used to actually indicate documents, <laughs> that's not true. Um, then down here, I don't know if you can see, but it basically reports a text, a classical text, the book of uh, uh, the, the Shang Shu, the, the book of history. And it basically says that that the ancient Shang had Yotsu, Yodian, they had, you know, books and classics. So we do find a confirmation of this character here in the ancient classical text, and we find it in Oracle Bone. So I just, uh, you know, have to kind of uh, come to the conclusion. The other thing is that it's found also in Oracle, in the bronze inscription from the later dynasty. And uh, you see here the inscription begins uh, on the right and so over here. And the last uh, uh, thing says using the documents, so the king's decree, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the king ordered that this vessel be made for the Duke of Zhou. So, what do we know? We do know for certain on Li Feng at Columbia University has written an article uh, very um, interesting about uh, how these documents were used. In the sense the documents were always carried around when they were making these bronzes, they had the documents nearby. Stuff was written down and then eventually when the bronze was cast, um, it was uh, uh, the documents were called out to transcribe the inscription or to describe the event that were already recorded there. So this these documents were around. Is there something we can do about that? I mean, it's a, you know an argument at at, at Cynthia and uh, um, yeah, uh, I think they do exist, and I think that uh, uh, maybe eventually they will come out. But I think that ultimately the origins of Chinese writing is to be found in the Neolithic, the late Neolithic signs, and particularly the one originated in Dawanko. It's been noted that in the late Neolithic, there is a severe climatic uh, changes in China, and that there is a, a lot of flooding of the Yellow River in this area here, where the Dawanko people are. So, um, there, we do notice a migration from the east to the west. This is the area where eventually the Xia and the Shang um, set up, so the Henan area here, Henan Shanxi area. So the, we do see a movement there. We also see a movement and influence over here. So what I theorize is that these people had a signing system and then they um, kind of started to move under duress. They met with other populations and eventually um, through this interaction in the late Neolithic, uh, starting in the, um, 2500 BC, there started to uh, take shape a signing system that would come into being in the early Bronze Age. So I'm going to end it here. Thank you so much, Paula. It was truly wonderful and it, it's really broadened the horizon. Um, clearly the big question here is when do we call phonetic a thing that shows up and gets to be then harnessed into a system that is used at a later period for a different thing, namely writing. And, and this is a really big question because you could have emblems that are as early as the Neolithic that get to be transported and carried in the, you know, in the collective consciousness, as you say, 
and then get to be channeled into a system or you may not. So mm -hmm. the, the, the big question here is when can we call this phonetic and is there a point in which that can be really contextualized and this is where the scholarship is really kind of you know at, at odds as it were. Yeah, I, I just uh, think that the uh, Chinese writing has been subjected to this linguistic uh, kind of um, um, interpretation for too long and that uh, we need to kind of broaden <laughs> the interpretation. Can I ask you, how big is the Neolithic material? Because you showed us a lot and I didn't think that there was so much there. No, there is a lot of stuff. They, 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 Mm, the problem is it's mostly that, uh, you know, there is a significant amount of stuff about 2,500, I would say, but then you start to have a decline once you get closer to about 2,000. So the question to me is, uh, is it at that point that they started to transition to perishable material? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things is like, if you think about uh, Egypt, uh, um, you know, for instance, they wrote on papyrus and they wrote on stone and, uh, and so on. So they, uh, they were lucky that the papyrus survived. Uh, if, if the Chinese had written on papyrus, nothing would have survived. But also the Chinese didn't write on stone, stone because there is really very little stone architecture in ancient China. So most of the architecture is timber. Mm -hmm. uh, timber and pounded earth. Um, so that uh, even if they wrote on those things, we don't, we wouldn't have it. Um, so it's, uh, the, the question is at a certain point in the late Neolithic, maybe the transition to some perishable material, I, you know, it's. Um, but, the, but the material that we do have on non-perishable stuff and non-perishable supports, how big is it? Like, are we talking in the hundreds of attestations or, or much less? You mean individual signs? Yeah. Oh, no, there are hundreds of individual signs, yes. Okay. Um, the, the one from Taiwan Go are probably more like around 30 or so. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one from Yanju, they may be 15 signs. So that is a little bit more iffy because it's not archeologically documented. Very interesting stuff from Shu Jiahe that's also about 20s or 30s pieces. Um, so yeah, no, there is a lot of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. the, the paucity of the stuff actually comes later. So, you know, up to the 2500 BC, everything is chugging along, it would just make sense. Yeah. Then you would expect to have more yeah. and instead you have less. less. And so the only thing that has come out lately is that Tao Si, uh, lately in the past 10 years, that Tao Si, um, painted in red, and that's clearly a Chinese character. There's no doubt, and that's 1900 BC. And then there is Xiao Shuan Chao, which is pre Anyang, and uh, that connects very well. And it's interesting that they both use cinnabar and brush. Yeah. So, so, and the, uh, can I ask one more last question, and then I'll leave it to the floor. I have so many actually. Um, the fish but, pictograph. I was quite struck by that. I mean, that, that, is, that is a sign or a symbol that, or an emblem from its very beginning that has a very clear diagnosticity that, and then ends up in the Shang dynasty material. So that creates a real continuum in terms of sign shape, right? I yeah. mean, that, yeah. would you say that, I, that that is in the repertoire that you have, that is the only sign that shows the same, with the same clarity, that level of diagnosticity? Uh, no, there is another one, um, but uh, there is one that shows two eyes from early toe, mm -hmm. which has been taken to be a decoration, but actually that same shape um, shows up also in characters. I wonder if I have a picture somewhere. I'm trying to get this book published and uh, I have all my pictures. When is the book coming out? Uh, well, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> But, um, and that is early Bronze Age, right? That is from the... Yes, yes, mm -hmm. uh, it's early Bronze Age. Yeah. 
So, but the, the point is that there's more. We can reconstruct in a way correspondences that, that draw that continuum, that trajectory. To yeah, I think uh, definitely, yes. Um, not a huge number, but um, definitely something is there. Okay. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm optimistic. <laughs> so. So there is scope, you think, that the repertoire in terms of these correspondences down to the invention of writing or down to the systematization of writing in the Shan Dynasty can be expanded, can be broadened in terms of uh, systematic analysis of the sign shapes? I think so, yes. Okay. Okay, okay. I'm going to shut up now <laughs> and wait for some questions from the audience. Are there any? You can unmute yourselves. And I see that there's John Baines connected. Hello, John, lovely to see you. And Wolfgang Baer as well, experts. Yeah. If you would like to ask a question, we would love to hear you. Uh, hello, I would have a sort of general comment, which I think could help to, to think about how to bridge the gap you've been talking about between the late Neolithic where you're getting these signs on hard materials and then you don't get them so much in the, at the beginning of the Bronze Age. And I think I would explain this in terms of increasing social inequality and complexity, meaning that people are developing comparable repertoires in materials that don't survive. So if you are using textiles, wood and other um, high cultural products, then they're not going to show up in the, uh, in the archaeological record in the same way as a sign that's on a very large pot in a burial will do. And so I think that we could think that it's a movement of a repertory away from the material context in which it was happening earlier. Uh, that doesn't itself contribute to saying something about writing. It's a, still we're still the background to writing, I guess. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good idea. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Can I can I ask one? Of course, Miguel. Thank you so much for for this lovely talk. Of course, um, uh, lately I've I've been thinking about these kinds of signs that are uh, well sometimes treated as semantic plus semantic compounds. And I, I was just wondering why you think uh, it is so problematic to accept them as such, uh, because I think if I'm not missing any detail, I think that accepting this kind of signs and the way they are constructed doesn't mean that we need to think of the whole system of writing as ideographic or anything like that, just that you can expand and create new signs by combining shapes that you had there in the system uh, to begin with, and then create a new logogram, uh, to use a, a simple word, create a new logogram uh, with that architecture. I'm, I'm thinking of cases like uh, the, that classical example from Mesopotamian cuneiform, where you join the head sign and the uh, the 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 nim the, the cup sign the ball sign and it means to eat and it i think it um, operates as a logogram or uh, a case from egyptian where you have this m sitting man with an or and this is the determinative for for when you spell the word to sail and of course you have a, a hieroglyph for or and you have a hieroglyph uh, of a sitting man with with uh, many different functions, but... Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, the, the answer to that is very complicated. And I think it has to do more with contemporary ideology and uh, with some history and uh, anathema surrounding the word um, ideogram. So um, I don't have a problem with that. I always tread very lightly because, as I said, I've been called a Chinese nationalist. <laughs> so I don't want to run into trouble by suggesting that they are, you know, uh, logical compounds. The logical compound, or, you know, lo and behold, the ideograph thing, seem, like this is all originated from the fact that uh, the 
uh, you know, the, the kind of the study of Chinese writing started uh, in the in, in the West. I mean, by Europeans, it started uh, uh, with the arrival of the Jesuits uh, in China and Athanasius Kircher um, and uh, his studies also of Egyptian writing kind of came to influence the way these writing systems were seen. And so they were depicted as ideographic, like that they represented ideas rather than language, which obviously is not the case. But obviously an ideograph or a logical compound could just as well represent an idea without the, you know, suggesting that the language <laughs> is ideographic or like, you know, symbolic. So for, yeah. for the Chinese, that's not a problem at all. That's the way they have analyzed these characters. It has become a problem mostly for Western scholarship uh, um, where the, the, uh, the sheer suggestion that you could take two pictographs, put them together and that will evoke a third meaning has become a sign of not adhering to correct thought. So, um, I just, uh, you know, I'm always perplexed um, at why there's been th this, this um, a, a lot of um, emotional uh, animosity relating to this debate about ideographs, but particularly about this idea that compounds can evoke, you know, compounds of two pictographs can evoke a third meaning. I, I just, uh, you know, frankly, I'm puzzled. But uh, the study of Chinese writing uh, you know, and of Chinese, ancient Chinese culture is fraught with a lot of contemporary and historical baggage. So that, uh, you know, I'm sometimes dismayed because I, you know, I studied in Italy and then I studied in China. And because I studied in China, I kind of acquired a way of kind of uh, um, thinking more from kind of historical point of view or from uh, I would say, you know, I learn from my Chinese teachers and I respect their knowledge a lot because obviously, you know, it's their own culture. So I, don't, I, I think the coming from the outside also has value. But I was dismayed for years when I saw this attack on Chinese scholars as not, you know, being proficient in the study of their own language or not being scientific. So I, uh, you know, th th there's a lot there. There are a lot of layers, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, the studies, sometimes uh, uh, Chinese archeologists are called nationalists um, and that, you know, they are presented as being um, subject to pressure from the Chinese government to propose that Chinese writing began very early, um, you know, or to compete with Egypt. There may be such things, but I think that you know we have to assume that our colleagues, uh, Chinese scholars, archaeologists, paleographers, have an integrity, and therefore that we should respect their work. Which you know sometimes from Western um, investigators, I you know I thought it was lacking, and that's you know it has a lot to do with with the logic, the idea of the logical compounds. Yes, I see the, there is a broader yeah. ideological yeah. background to some As is questions. Of questions. Any more questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Oh, Judith, hello. Hello. I, I'm not sure if it was an intentional omission or it wasn't relevant to your subject, but I, on my own hobby horse was missing any mention of early glyptic. Uh, is there none as, until the Shang period and, uh, and later? Because it seems to me if you have early writing, it, it's, it's a medium of support that might well be there. It's there in so many of the societies when and before writing. Was the glyptic at this time? Of course, it could have been made of wood, but one would have thought hard materials as well. Uh, no, they had some seals. I think there's been a debate about whether or not they really date to the Shang Dynasty. They're certainly very important. Um, 
And the, in the Neolithic, I don't know much of, about that. I don't. Well, I, I'm thinking more of the period leading up to the Shang and the that already developed form of writing. Uh, there seems to be no interplay. It's, it's, it seems to be a gap. Yeah, there is a gap. Okay. Thank you. Interesting. Any more questions? I'll ask one, Paola, sorry, I, because I'm, I'm really, <laughs> really curious about that ding gong shard, which was very odd, right? Because it looks so complex. And yet, well, I mean, relatively early, you know, 2500 BC, and you seem to be very skeptical about it. You really didn't like to sort of assume that it could be any form of, um, you know, the thing of writing. Uh, the ding dong is, um, is kind of falling into oblivion. In your, in your mind or in the scholarship? I was in the scholarship. Um, I don't know what to think about the thing. Because it's out of context? Because the date is could be unreliable? I, know. I mean, I have to, you know, to tell you, like I was in China and I was asking questions about that and they said, just, you know, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's wonderful. Um, uh, there's a question oh, okay. from Marina Gallinaro. Can you talk a little bit more about the areas of distribution of late Neolithic materials and oracle bones and bronze inscriptions? Do the areas overlap? I think you did. Yeah, they do overlap. Um, I mean, the oracle bones is mostly in the, the Middle Yellow River Valley, mostly, but there are some other ones. And uh, but the bronze inscription are much more widespread. I mean that, that there is a significant overlap. Mm. I mean, it obviously, it, it, you know, I would have to give a more archaeological like introduction to kind of discuss all the intricacies. But um, the we do know that the Shang, for instance, originated probably in the east, and they may have had may have been descendant at least from these people of the Down Coast. So then they they definitely moved west. There is evidence of that. Uh, they probably so you know because of all these floods, uh, the direct overlapping is unclear because some of the earliest sites of the Shang are under meters and meters of silt in the lower Yellow River Valley. So it's, it's been very difficult to also to excavate and whatever you find may not, I mean, may not be there anymore. I mean, the, the, when the Yellow River changed course, it changed course several times, um, it really wiped out a lot of stuff, but uh, the overlapping, yes, it's there. Any more questions? Uh, I I would have one more little question, which is that you you showed the sherds from Shashang Chao, but you didn't say uh, whether you thought that this is part of a wider system, so that in practice people would already be using um, bamboo strips and things like that by that date. Uh, uh, in other words, whether the there is you know, there's a whole writing system. Uh, functioning by then or whether you think that that is that comes in the gap between then and Anyang? No, I do believe, yeah, sorry, I, made, I didn't make myself clear. Um, yes, I do believe that already by about, uh, by early Toh and starting about 1900 BC, there are bamboo strips, uh, there, are, there are perishable documents uh, written by brush either with the black or with the, uh, you know, cinnabar ink. And that what we see at Xiaoshan Chao is evidence of that practice on, uh, on the ceramic. And uh, we see also at Tao Su, so it's, uh, you know, kind of a similar thing. And that, that leads me to believe that uh, the, the standard practice was to write by brush with these inks and uh, they would normally write uh, on bamboo. At least, uh, I'm pretty convinced, at least from uh, 1900 BCE. Now, um, the, I mean, the, 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 
the thing is that, I mean, we do have historical records that talk about that. I mean, these records have been dismissed, but they do say there are records, uh, you know, there were records. And uh, the other thing that I want to point out is that not only is it difficult to write on bone, but um, if you think it of a society as complex as the Shang, if they had, you know, administrative records, they wouldn't have kept it on a piece of bone. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I expect, you know, when you think about Mesopotamia, you say, well, you know, they had this very cheap material that they could write on and then toss away. The Chinese probably had some cheap material too, as the Egyptian used papyrus. Uh, I suppose uh, that that's what they were doing. And uh, there is a lot of circumstantial evidence. So yes. And by the way, I really enjoyed all your books, which I'm reading. No, well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you have been guiding me in my like, rediscovery and like revenge of the, the non-linguists. Yeah. There, there you go, John. You get compliments on Scribo. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Paula. It was really a, a, a tour that broadened my own personal horizon. And I think there's a book in all of this, talking about books. Yeah, well, I submitted it to uh, Oxford University Press and I'm waiting um, for comments. I got some good feedbacks uh, and I expect they will probably be published. I hope oh, so. Great, it really, it really needs to be written and it really needs to be out. It's been wonderful to listen to you. And thank you so much for taking well, my Thank you so much for inviting me and also for inviting me to the great conference, uh, which I enjoyed so much. It was wonderful. And, uh, I'm very glad to meet virtually John Baines. <laughs> so, <laughs> I <so>. am too. <laughs> so, so that's great. One, day, one day live. Yeah. I was supposed to give a lecture at Brown exactly a year ago, but it didn't. Oh, <laughs> oh God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Next year, next year. Yeah. It has been wonderful to, to have Paola and to have this lovely discussion. I'll give the chance for one other question, one last remaining question, if anybody wants to ask it. If nobody wants to, then I will bid you all farewell. It has been great today. And we will see you in two weeks' time with Sarah Finlayson and a cognitive reading of the Aegean scripts. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Paula. Lovely to meet you online. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.